Hello ladies <coughs> and gentlemen, welcome back to the channel and today I want to be talking to you guys about alcohol and why the hell it is so difficult to kick this habit, why it is such a hellish habit to kick. It's uh, anyone that's ever been an alcoholic or anyone that's ever known an alcoholic will know it's hell. It's living hell, absolute living hell. And so why is this the case, right? And this ranges uh, from, and, and this touches, this topic touches everything from the like the absolute alcoholic that's totally demolished his entire life through to the problem drinker and sheds light on even why, why a problem drinker would be a problem drinker. And we must distinguish properly between an alcoholic, a binge drinker and, an, and, and, uh, and a problem drinker, right? So just to get into that quickly um alcoholism is actually an outright addiction right and there can be various reasons for this <clears throat> uh, uh, psychological or even physiological so for example so, uh, a lot of people are, uh, are aware or might be aware that alcohol can cause a dopaminergic reaction right uh, an increase in in a person's dopamine and so if a person has a a, a, a a deficit or a dysfunction in their dopaminergic reward system then alcohol can be used can become a, an, a, an addictive substance of choice to sort that problem out so for example people with ADD it can be quite common because there's a deficiency in there is a broken uh, dopaminergic system um, I've got I've got attention deficit disorder and whilst I, I personally never had a problem with alcohol I did actually find that I developed a problem with food and um, and uh, uh, energy drinks as a result because of a uh, there is a broken dopaminergic reward system that is uh, that's involved there which is why uh, uh, sort of amphetamines and stuff like that tend to work so well to treat uh, uh, attention deficit disorder then you have binge drinking binge drinking is a is a predominantly social activity right um, so outside of the particular social milieu that person doesn't really drink uh, uh, a lot probably even at all right it might be it is it can be the case where a person doesn't drink at all but when they're in a social situation they then they go all out and this would be an example of 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 alcohol of the instrumentalization of alcohol where i'm in a social situation and i'm using alcohol in order to be able to to be more social it helps it helps me out and then you have uh, problem drinkers and a problem drinker is someone that uses alcohol to regulate mood and emotion um and so this and so this can actually overlap with uh, with alcoholism so for example like i was talking about add where add comes with depression or can come with depression and it can come with with uh, a, a lack of 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 drive to do things and stuff like that and then alcohol can be used to 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 regulate those kinds of things, um, to regulate dispositions and stuff like that. So there can be overlap between these things, but they are they are distinct. Um, and so this, uh, ladies and gentlemen, is to follow up, uh, not f not follow up really, but basically my most successful video, which is uh, sitting at about th a little over three thousand views by this point and more comments and so by by orders of magnitude my most successful video on alcoholism where i discussed how how alcohol affects the person uh, how how it affects your personality your personality traits your big five personality traits how alcohol actually affects those so this one um and since it was so and this was two years ago so since that that was so uh, uh, uh how can it su successful uh clearly people are, are, are searching uh for this topic because it's a problem today and increasingly so alcoholism alcohol related problems are increasing in the world and we need to understand why this this is the case right um it's one thing to say well here's how it changes the personality uh traits and stuff like that but it's another thing to say well why do we get, why do we get started in the first place right uh what, what's the uh, why do we get it started in, in the first place and then why is it so bloody difficult to kick the habit right it's it's ridiculous um and it, it doesn't make sense that it should be so difficult and what we need to understand and this is something that people always fail to to realize is that we are primarily psychological creatures <laughs> right um when you see people going out there and they say, ah, oh, uh, like sleeping around, having casual sex, ah, oh, it's because I just enjoy sex. That's rubbish, right? Even, 
uh, uh, because our species, whether, whether you believe in evolution or whether you believe in creation, it doesn't matter. We understand that our species has come to a point where we revolve around the mind, the brain. We've got these big brains. We, we, we think about stuff. We, 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 we're philosophical. We, we look for meaning in things and stuff like that. So most, and so the, the, most of the stuff that, yes, there are things that can go wrong with the body, that cause problems, right? It's just diseases and stuff like that. But the mind is is most of the stuff that we do or do not do in, is because of the mind. It's because something's going on in the mind. The mind is not physical, right? Regardless what many people would like to otherwise assert. And if for those of you that are interested in the mind brain interaction, I've got a video on that. Go look it up. The mind is not the brain is not the mind and the mind is not the brain. Okay? Even though they can affect each other. Right? But we are mostly mind. When we have a prob dysfunction with sex, when we have a dysfunction, it's because the something in the mind is involved. And when you talk about mind, you're also talking about emotions. You're talking about spirituality for those who are given to that sort of thing. Um, and and so we need to realize this um, this this business. And a lot of people want to discount that because when they look at when we talk about the mind, people because the, because the modern man is is uh, and woman and woman right the modern man and the modern woman have become so uh modernistic that to speak of the mind is like speaking is almost like speaking about hocus pocus and 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 religion in a way right uh, the talking about the mind is for religious people we need to look for a physical cause and we need to medicalize everything right and we see this as a problem today we're trying to medicalize absolutely everything let's forget about treating you as a holistic individual let's just discover the the circuit that has gone wrong pump you full of uh, uh, medical uh, chemicals and and off you go and we've realized this is an absolute failure absolute bloody failure we we see this failure with with treating depression we see we, it's just it's ridiculous right it's 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 crazy and um if 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 simply adding chemicals to the problem right a substance to the problem fix the problem <laughs> then there would be no such thing as substance abuse because you would fix the problem wouldn't you right it should bring you back to some normal state where you could then function normally like for example if a person has a disease and you give them medication right if there's actually a physical disease and you give them medication that medication fixes them up to the point where they can then begin to function normally right so why doesn't the same thing work because at the end of the day, alcohol is a substance, right? Alcohol is a substance. All the different drugs we take, these are all substances. Why did they then not have the same effect as medication, right? It's because it's not a physical problem. It's not a physical problem. It's a mental, it's a psychological problem, right? So that takes me to my, to my first point right now. There are alcohol. We're going to discuss the effects of alcohol and we're going to discuss the utility of alcohol so that we can sort of see, see what's going on. Right? So f firstly, what we need to understand is that <coughs> when I say we need to understand, let me be, uh, let me be more precise. The, there is a debate which is not settled. It's not settled. However, the leaning, the inclination, right, for many people, uh, and I agree, is that alcohol is not a brain disease. It's not a it's not a brain disorder of some kind, right? The causal relationship, because there's a problem with cause and effect. So what is causing what, right, uh, is is the problem. So if we scan the brain of an alcoholic, we can find certain things going on. But is it the is it the deformity in the brain that caused the alcoholism, or is it the alcoholism that deformed the brain? which way which way around is the co is the causal loop and <clears throat> in the drive for the world to medicalize absolutely everything because it's profitable it's profitable right we want to medicalize something once i've medicalized it i can make money from the treatments from the pharmacological drugs etc etc and so you can see why some people are and and it hasn't worked it hasn't worked and you can see why some people are beginning to come away. And I believe that this is incorrect as well. It is not a brain disease. And I'll tell you why. <clears throat> very, very simple, straightforward and logic. It's not a brain disease because if it's a brain disease, if you've got something like ADD or Tourette's or schizophrenia or whatever these kind, it doesn't go away. Okay? When you've got the disease, when you've got the disorder, when you've got the brain damage, it doesn't go away. 
you can't <laughs> you can't decide right i'm going to stop having schizophrenia you can't decide like i've got AD i can't decide i'm now gonna stop having attention deficit disorder isn't it things you can just yet you can make the choice to stop being an alcoholic and you can work on those things and you can eventually stop being an alcoholic right therefore it means that whether we're conscious of of it or not that a alcoholism is not a brain disease and b and this is the most difficult thing to accept alcoholism is a is a choice right it is a choice in the sense that we have an issue we're looking for a solution to that issue and then we select one of many possible solutions so if i talk about like my add one of my solutions was uh, i uh, i regulated my dopaminergic uh, reward system with food and with energy drinks right but this is a choice in 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 a way i could have done it in different ways and so even though it feels like i don't have a choice it is still a choice because i could stop doing it and i've done that today because i woke up i realized once i understood what i was doing wrong and i had many many issues that i had to work through once i worked through all of these things then i no longer uh, have these kinds of problems on the odd occasion if i'm having a really 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 rough time i might have like a red bull or something and that helps bring me down off my tree sort of thing but I don't abuse it anymore. It doesn't, uh, 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 regular, uh, you know, my life anymore. I've lost weight. I'm healthier. It, all these kinds of things, and these things have really, really helped, right? So it doesn't feel like a choice. And believe me, if there's the first thing you tell an alcoholic, uh, this is a choice, man. They don't feel like they have uh, ever had a choice in this, right? They, they don't. And that's, and I'm going to say a lot of things in this video that are very, very are going to be very difficult to hear. Are going to be very, very difficult to hear. And one thing we need to understand. Uh, let's say you are not an alcoholic, but you know someone that is, and this information might help them. Unfortunately, the pain of hearing certain things, until the pain of the alcohol, of the alcoholism or the problem, is greater than the pain of hearing these things, the person is not going to want to hear it, okay? <laughs> because, the, as we're going to see, the alcoholism is essentially a person trying to escape pain right is one of the one of the big reasons that it's it's a it it helps regulate pain um so so let's get into it so it's not a brain disease and actually turns out it most likely and again this is still debated but it looks like it is a choice even though we might think it, it not necessarily uh the case so here's one of the first effects is it changes your empathy right there is a misconception around that it eliminates empathy this is not true uh, it's got a paradoxical effect on empathy so it it decreases and increases empathy so what alcohol does is it decreases your empathy towards your loved ones decreases empathy towards your loved ones which is why alcoholics will abuse their families will abuse their friends etc etc right that's why the, the alcohol seems to have this effect those who are nearest and dearest to you are going to get it in the neck because alcohol reduces empathy for your nearest and dearest however it increases your empathy towards strangers which is why you will tend to want to uh, 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 it, it, it encourages them to to uh, make friends with strangers to look after strangers uh, uh, give their money to strangers uh, end up having sex with strangers and stuff like that because it increases empathy towards strangers that's uh, uh, and a lot of people uh, if you've ever had this uh, it probably clicks straight away it's like damn you know <laughs> that explains a lot right where, where the alcoholic if you had like an alcoholic father or an alcoholic mother you 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 know it's like man they were hell they were hell towards you man but for like other people they seem to be so nice to other people especially strangers people other people's kids that had nothing to do with you and yet with the people that were closest to them they treated them like absolute trash right it's it's a it's rough second it is disinhibitory right so in life we have inhibitions and those inhibitions are either coming from your personality traits so for example if you've got high uh, uh, personality trait conscientious you, you're going to be quite an inhibited person quite there's a lot of self-control 
things I won't I will and won't do right and also you get it in from the outside from society from your parents from society if you're part of a religious group or any particular group or your teachers in school that tell you this is right this is wrong uh, there's the law there's the police there's the legal system this is right this is wrong do this don't do that and what and if you do that there's punishment there's consequences and all these kinds of things and so we are inhibited right these things and we we regulate in that sense so what alcohol does is it opens the floodgates right so if there's something that you do you, you you really uh, uh so you you when you see the person is acting completely out of character right it's almost like this person has changed like this multiple personality disorder what you are seeing is not necessarily the this is another misconception what you are seeing is not necessarily the real person it's like the real person hasn't gone right the real person is still there however you are seeing a side of them that is usually inhibited okay so we we must not say that the person that we see uh during alcohol uh, during an alcohol uh, uh binge or whatever the case might be that that is the true person we shouldn't say that because to say that that is the true person it's too absolute it's you're not seeing the whole person and nothing but right you are seeing a part of the person and we must be very careful and it's very very easy for for human beings to ascribe certain things to other people especially when they upset us and when they hurt us when they offend us to say oh well you are just a bad person right that badness that I saw, that represents all of you it's not it's not we are all mixtures of good and bad uh and there's reasons for things and happening and stuff like that so when you see when you see a person behave in ways and you're like man what's going on it's because the the inhibitions have been brought up right so usually what happens is if one of the ways that helps us to not uh be overly harsh on people is we need to realize all of us are inhibited every single one of us has urges and desires and stuff like that that are socially or morally unacceptable but we sublimate them and we put that energy into more constructive things because we know this is wrong this is wrong i can't do that so when the alcohol comes in and the inhibitions are lifted we are no longer particularly concerned about right or wrong it's like i want to do it so i'm going to go and do it <laughs> you understand what i'm saying so so that 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 tendency that that uh, ability to sublimate bad inclinations and and stuff like that right so for example the sex drive in your normal state you could be a very normal moral person i'm not going to have sex with anyone except for my wife i'm going to be faithful i'm going to whatever and and that sex drive is inhibited it's like it's for my wife only in this circumstance and i love her da, 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 da. right right but then in comes the alcohol that ability is gone right it's actually stripping me of my ability to 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 do that and also because it strips away my empathy right because part of the reason why i won't cheat on my wife is the empathy and love that i have for her i don't want to hurt her i don't want to all these kinds of things but if that empathy is gone and the inhibition is gone all well, then then the sex drive takes over the animal part takes over and there's no thought there's no then animal part <laughs> off it goes right so there's that in disinhibition and when that person is acting a lot of people say where that that behavior where does it come from it doesn't come from nowhere right it's acting on pre-existing on pre-existing desires <coughs> so whatever the person is doing that behavior those desires those tendencies pre-exist the alcohol they right they predate the alcohol okay and this is a <laughs> very difficult thing to accept um the third one is beer goggles right so so the reason why or one of the reasons at least why uh people end up sleeping with people who are very unattractive or they wake up the next morning <laughs> you're like what what's that <laughs> right is because because of the effect that um alcohol has on our perception of symmetry of symmetry right so obviously we find symmetry to be very very attractive and obviously the less symmetrical you are the less attractive you tend to be to other people right alcohol distorts the perception of symmetry so that even people who are highly asymmetrical appear significantly more symmetrical and therefore significantly more um uh significantly more attractive which is then why we can then uh one our empathy increases to the stranger and we become quite indiscriminate <laughs> in at least as far as 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 uh as 
uh, looks go and also as far as morals and stuff goes because remember we, we disinhibited and so on and so forth right um <clears throat> and uh, so the fourth the fourth effect is it disguises hesitancy right Hes when you hesitate so for example one thing that is very very common is a lot of people sometimes feel there's something that's known as a sort of imposter syndrome and not everyone has it so as to the point where it's actually a syndrome but you feel like you don't really belong you feel like you're kind of faking it you feel like uh you know i'm 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 an imposter i don't really belong here i'm faking this i'm i'm is you know and people are going to discover me and and a lot of time if you're like trying to to be someone you aren't you're trying to pretend you, you're putting on a facade you're faking and stuff like that because because you're pretending your responses aren't as straightforward and instantaneous and as natural that they otherwise would be so so the alcoholism uh if there is something that i need to react to right so it's, there's a so for example something you might notice some before uh, someone's about to do something stupid or whatever what do they do they have a, they they pause they swig the the beer or the whatever and they're like hold my beer now i'm going to do it. that pause is that is that moment of it, it the alcohol drinking consumption disguises the hesitancy right you know let me steal have the alcohol let me steal myself now i go for it right whereas if that hesitancy wasn't that moment of to steal yourself that hesitancy wasn't there pro person probably wouldn't end up doing it so that act of that that pause to drink to 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 laugh to do whatever it, it disguises hesitancy it and it ameliorates uh the sort of imposter syndrome the fact uh, that that fakeness syndrome that that i'm trying to put on something what's my next move what's the what am i going to say next and all of these kinds of things um it's it it it's so you know it it disguises those his that hesitation right uh effect number five is it it provides an alloplastic defense right so basically um it it provides you with an alibi essentially right um that thing that i did wasn't really me it was the alcohol it was the alcohol talking it uh, so an alloplastic defense is is when a person has done something and an alloplastic defense is a is a is an excuse or or something that allows me to distance myself from the person who did that thing right it's a it's a that's what they call it and uh, it wasn't really me it wasn't really my fault uh, when you try to blame you tr when you try to to it's the, the avoidance of responsibility for something that you're ashamed of right because in that situation your desire for your empathy goes out the window your inhibition goes out the window your morals go out the window a lot of things go out the window your your you don't care about consequences you don't care about what other people think you you just you, you don't care you go and you do something and you're like and now and now once the alcohol is gone away and now that all of those things come in flooding now you do care now you feel shame you feel all these kinds of things like oh bloody hell <laughs> Oh, what are people going to think of me right now that you're in your normal state of mind you're like oh man you know and then oh no that wasn't really me and all of that kind of stuff and um and so it actually provides people with what is called an alloplastic defense i was drunk uh and both men and women use this by the way so when i'm talking about this stuff this affects men and women right there's a reason why so for example if you look at at women with borderline personality disorder they use alcohol in this sense a lot right they're going to go they want to go out they want to self trash they want to sleep around they want to do all these kinds of things and then they use alcohol they always use alcohol to bring out the uh, to to remove the inhibitions so that they can do so that they can go out and self trash and self harm right so some women they went instead of self harming with a blade a knife to cut themselves they self harm by going out and sleeping with random strangers and allowing and giving themselves up to the abuse the sexual abuse of strangers um as as a as a means of self-harm 
so the alcohol disinhibits that and then she'll feel ashamed and now she what the alcohol provides an alloplastic defense of no i wasn't in control i'm, I'm the victim here it wasn't really me um, and a lot of people fall for that for, fall tend to fall for that lie because they don't realize that the only reason sh she got drunk in the first place was so that could actually happen because she was going through her own crisis and she wanted to to self-harm right and then that was an example of self-harm and so and it's a really it's a really tragic it's a really really tragic thing and a lot of people's lives are ruined as a result um and one of the m most pernicious things is not only that you get then many many people who are falsely accused of rape people who are genuine genuine victims of rape are then not taken as seriously because they are those those women that do lie and so it's a really it's a it's a horrible thing man uh, uh, uh that that really needs to 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 uh, you know be looked at sort of thing uh six uh, it affects your memory so so a lot of a lot of people like ah oh, you know one glass of wine no, no. no from the very very first glass your memory is affected and this gets obviously gets worse and worse as you go along um and then at a certain uh level of saturation <laughs> of alcohol saturation long-term memory is get killed gets killed off right um so the long-term memory uh switches off and then at a certain other point even even your short short-term memory is gone <clears throat> right so technically technically right uh alcohol qualifies as a dis so a dissociative uh it plays a dissociative function so it, when you look at people with stuff like dissociative personality disorder where there's a part of themselves they don't have access to they don't remember so alcohol is in this sense used to go and do certain things and part of the defense mechanism is i no longer remember because it's a form of dissociation something that was shameful something that was traumatic something that whatever it helps you dissociate right and the problem with 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 excessive alcoholism is that it can actually permanently damage the memory centers in your brain irreversibly you'll never get it back never get it back right um which is one of the reasons where people think that it is the alcoholism that damages the brain rather than the brain disorder causing the alcoholism right although of course there are certain disorders like a broken dopaminergic system which can actually be found like in add which is a genetic it's actually a genetic uh, disorder uh, about five five to seven genes that regulate dopamine are actually dysfunctional so in that sense you know you know so it's complex it's not one or the other all the time okay but for the majority of people for the majority of people it is it is uh it, it is not a disease it's not because of a disease okay so so these are, are, are uh, you know it's 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 uh, so it's dissociated if it's literally it's a dissociation you are dissociated from a part of yourself right that's very very unhealthy right because in something that is very very common uh, we call, then call it a disorder with people that have but like borderline personality disorder multiple personality disorder these are disorders of dissociation even narcissistic disorder and borderline they have dissociative uh, uh, dimensions to them um, as well it's really really it's really really a problem and like and was something that they call they said that dissociation is egocentric. so if I can't remember if I, I don't have access to that part of me it allows me to maintain the illusion or the idea that I'm a good person that I didn't do X and Y and Z or that X and Y and Z didn't happen to me okay it's egocentric it's 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 uh, allows me to preserve a certain view of myself and then um, uh, uh, alcohol and then the seventh one is alcohol myopia so alcohol myopia what it does is it it encourages a very very uh, te a temporary but very very stereotypical grandiose narcissist so that guy who's acting very macho I'm gonna fight I'm the man I'm <laughs> I'm God's gift to woman right that's the alcohol myopia and conversely for a woman 
that hypersexual, that very histrionic way of that she's laughing and she's very ostentatious and she's very all over the place and she's very she's very sexualized and very sexually open and all these kinds of things because that is that grandiose right that's that's narcissism right you build you're making yourself up to be like you are all it all you are the king or you are the queen of everything right and i'm look at me i'm so attractive i'm so desirable i'm god's gift to women or i'm god's gift to men look at how the men are find me so irresistible sort of thing right um it's 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 quite a problem and so and the problem with that grandiosity when you have that grandiosity in uh, that's uh, that's very typical of narcissism right and this is something we need to understand ladies and gentlemen all of us all of us without dis without <laughs> without exception we are all narcissistic the only difference is to what degree we have we are narcissistic and whether the the narcissism we do have is healthy or it is not healthy so when you are an infant for example your narcissist you have narcissism everyone starts out life as a narcissist when you are an infant right but that's healthy that grandiosity gives you the courage to separate and individuate from your mother because the world is terrifying okay for a tiny little child everything is terrifying and so in order to go out into the world and be your own person and separate from your mother which is that sense of safety it requires a, it requires a kind of grandiosity but in the proper development of the child that gets toned down and, and, and it's and it's sublimated and it becomes legitimate confidence or whatever the case might be sort of thing but when you have grandiosity when you are grandiose you think you are invincible and when you think you're invincible, you become A, gullible, so you can get taken advantage of. Because you're so grandiose, you think no one can take advantage of you. You think, you th you fully believe that you are going to see, you are going to, uh, you're going to smell the rat from a mile away. When the rat could be right under your nose and you wouldn't know. Because you're so grandiose, it becomes a, you become a, a, a type of blindness. And this is often why uh, you see women who are drunk put themselves into really, really dangerous situations where the, something happens to them. They get sexually assaulted, they get killed. And you think, you know, what the hell was this woman thinking putting herself in that situation? That's why. Because the grandiosity thinks, well, I'm, I'm in charge. I'm invincible. Nothing can happen to me. And so a woman will go with a complete stranger, complete stranger. She doesn't know if the guy is a psycho killer or what. <laughs> She's got no idea. But the grandiosity makes her blind to that, makes her blind to that danger, blind to that threat. And she'll go with any moron, with any moron. Uh, and your first warning, your first warning, if a guy is happy to be with you when you are drunk, you are with the wrong guy. simple you with the wrong kind of guy right so the christian ethic where people should stay away from alcohol because there is danger there it, it's true it's true if you if you with a guy that's quite happy for you to get drunk out of your mind and 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 he shows more interest in you when you are drunk you're dealing with a snake okay you're dealing with a snake okay and you're putting you risking risking your even your life it's life-threatening right um and then also that grandiosity is a feeling of uh, i can do i can go i can whatever so the person will be more likely to to spend a ridiculous ridiculous amount of money which is why a person they can go out on a binge and they can like blow 500 pounds a thousand pounds boom like that and then they're basically destitute for the rest of the month because they will overspend they become compulsive shopping uh, uh you know they'll, they'll have unprotected sex which is why again you know the stds will never go away <laughs> because until people keep doing this illegitimate children uh, unprotected sex there's there's no there's no sense of that risk because you're so grandiose all, all thoughts of risk and threat and danger and consequence go right out the window, right out the window. And so you've, you've, you've got a, you've got a, uh, you've got a very serious problem. Um, so, uh, to talk quickly about, uh, so those are the seven, the seven effects that alcohol has on the brain. Okay. 
um, it's not a brain disease, but that it, it makes your uh, it, it it makes your brain behave as if it's you've got a brain disease of some of some uh, description. Um, and uh, just one thing for people to know: anyone that is claiming to have a blackout or a brownout, whether this is or is not true, so the person could be lying to you. Oh, I don't remember, right? Because remember, what did we say? It provides you with an alloplastic defense. So if a person's like, "Oh, I drank two whole bottles of vodka and I had a blackout and I don't remember anything." The blackouts or brownouts depend not only on how much alcohol you drink, but how quickly you drink it. So basically, uh, the formula for, for blackout or brownout is quantity over time, over a short amount of time. So if you had a, an entire bottle of vodka in five seconds, you can, all right, he probably did have a blackout or brownout. But he ha if he had an entire bottle of vodka over the course of an entire night, then he's lying to you. Or she's lying to you they remember everything okay they're lying to you okay but they're lying to you that because this provides them with an alloplastic defense they did what they wanted to do they now have an alibi an excuse because the alcohol legitimizes that that narcissistic grandi grandiose behavior and so you know and now they're trying to make an excuse for it sort of thing right uh to be to restore ego uh ego syntony right so why is it so uh so now this makes people <laughs> I, I, it makes someone sound like they're really evil but it, this is not actually necessarily the case all right so why is alcohol so damn difficult to kick to kick to get rid of to kick that habit why because what most, most people don't realize is that alcohol is actually very, 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 very highly adaptive. It's adaptive, okay? And the reason why we see narcissistic behaviors come up with alcohol is because when you study personality disorders, you realize that personality disorders are a, an adapt, adaptation to trauma to a world that is traumatic, to a world that is terrifying, to a world that is dangerous, to a world that is threatening. All of the personality disorders are adaptations to trauma, to stress, etc., etc. And narcissism is one of those adaptations. The only problem is not everyone is capable of being a grandiose narcissist. So when you talk about a failed narcissist, so all of the other personality disorders are technically failures. So when you're looking at a, at a, at a borderline, for example, a borderline is technically someone who tried to be a narcissist but failed, was not able to sustain the grandiosity Right, because it takes a lot of work <laughs> to sustain that grandiosity and all that kind of stuff. And when you look at these people, you realize that they were traumatized as children, as adolescents. At some point, there was a trauma. Something went wrong, and the development didn't didn't. Your life was at some point. Your life was a living hell, and certain things didn't develop properly. So what happens is the alcohol is adaptive in the sense that the alcohol allows you to become a narcissist and to gain all of the great things associated with being a narcissist, with being the biggest and the best and the baddest of them all. Right? It's adaptive, right? So this is why 60% of people who go through rehab and, and come off the alcohol, who come off the drink, will relapse 60% within one year. It's devastating. It's devastating. The reason for that, the reason for that is because, and this is one of the hardest things to understand, is because underlying the alcohol is a problem. You have a, a psychological, a mind, a mind issue that you're, not, that you're not getting hold of and sorting out, right? You might have the what's driving you to the alcohol might be that your personality is now disordered. Your mind is disordered because of some trauma that you experienced in the past. Something that just something that just knocked you over and bloody hell, you were never able to get back up without assistance from the alcohol.
right? And so you are now afraid to do things. You are now afraid to be so, something. You are, it, it, and it's just, it's like living life seems impossible unless you have that drink and all of a sudden you open up and now all of a sudden I can do stuff because, you know, and it's, it's intoxicating. It is not, it's not so much that the substance itself is intoxicating, but the experience of being intoxicating is itself intoxicating because now all of a sudden I'm not afraid. Now all of a sudden I can be the biggest and the baddest and the baddest and, and the sexiest. I no longer, you, you have a couple of drinks, I'm, I no longer am, uh, uh, I no longer hate the fact, hate the way I look. I no longer hate the way I look. So people with body dysmorphic issues and stuff, I no longer hate the way I look. I, I, I no longer hate the way I feel, no longer hate myself. I can be all of this stuff. It, it, it frees me from the shackles of the mental oppression that I suffer every single day. All right. Um, so it's highly, highly adept. So let's go through the points. There are four points. One, it's palliative, right? Like palliative care. It helps a person cope with dissonance, with pain, with frustration, with anxiety, stress, sadness, anger, da 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 It helps you cope with these things. And the reason, and so in, literally, w the, the, so let's say you've got a broken leg. What do you need? You need a crutch. You need a crutch because you, are, you, are need, you need a prosthesis to help you to, to, to support the function of something that's damaged, something that doesn't work properly. The leg doesn't work properly or the arm doesn't work properly. So I need a prosthetic, prosthetic limb, whatever the case might be. It's a type. So alcohol is literally a kind of prosthesis because I do not have the mechanisms, the normal healthy mechanisms, mental, characterological, whatever the case might be, mechanisms to cope and deal with negative emotions and stuff like that. Because that because that function is broken or is underdeveloped because maybe your parents weren't there because we had to learn this stuff from someone. Maybe your parents weren't there to teach you. Maybe your parents abandoned you. Maybe your parents hated you. Maybe your parents were narcissistic. Maybe your parents were psychopathic. Maybe you had psychopathic teachers who told you you were useless. Maybe you had psychopathic friends who told you, who abused you. you it, it could be anything. Whatever it was, your life was completely miserable and you were not allowed to develop and you were not helped to develop. So this thing is broken. So alcohol becomes literally a kind of prosthesis that that serves a function. It's a, a, you, are, you are exporting what should otherwise be an internal function. You are exporting it to the substance. It's the same thing with, 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 with drugs and all other kinds of addictions as well. It's pretty much the same thing, right? Which is why addictions are such hell to get over, right? Um, so, so uh, and now here's the interesting thing. We're finding in the world that women are becoming equal, equal to men in narcissism. <laughs> In narcissism and in alcoholism, they're becoming equal to men. Why? Because whilst the, the, the initial desires of feminism were legitimate, yeah, a woman should be able to, if she decides she wants to go there, she should be able to go there and over here, go here and do whatever it is. And so the initial desire for women to be able to go out and be woman in the world it was great the problem with feminism is it mutated and now women go out and they're not being women in the world they're pretending to be men women are going out and they're pretending to be men they're acting like men why <laughs> so all of these promises that were made that women are going to go into the world and they're going to bring whatever uniqueness that is inherent in femininity is now going to be fully expressed in the world. We don't see that. Unfortunately, that has been killed off. Because why? Because women are trying to be like men. It's like, <laughs> it defeats the whole point. <laughs> defeats the entire... The whole point of feminism, the original, the good, the decent, right? Not this craziness that you have today, right? The whole point of, of unleashing femininity 
into the world to bring whatever was unique to the woman out to benefit society. It's not there. Because women are trying to be like men. And because women are trying to be like men, they're now developing the same problems. They're becoming equally as narcissistic. They're becoming equally as alcoholic. They, they're, becoming, they're becoming men. And all of these benefits of femininity, where are they to be found? And they're nowhere to be found, unfortunately. Right? Unfortunately. And it's, it's a sad thing. It's, a, it's, it's shocking. <laughs> it's shocking. Right? It really, really is shocking. And, so, and, and women are getting uh, ground up and spit out of this process, you know. And it's just, it's so, it's not fair. Right? And people, and, and when you try to say something about how all of this has gone wrong, you get accused of hating women and all this. It's like, man, you've got no idea. Right. It's not about hating women. It's not. It's like all of that promise of the true of this of this fem of the the gifts of femininity to come into society. They haven't materialized because the women are out there trying to behave like men. So they tr they're having prom promiscu promiscuous sex like men. There's all of these all of these because women before women were the regulatory force. Women were the gatekeepers. They were the regulatory force on morals and behaviors and stuff like that in the world, right? Think about your mom. Your mom, say please, say thank you, don't hit your brother and sister, <laughs> right? And the women were the ones that used to select men, used to regulate men, right? I'm not interested in you unless you have a job, you have a car, you have this and this and that. You've got to bring something to the table, right? I'm not going to get together with any moron, right? So women were gatekeepers and the regulators of the quality of men, right? Now that women are becoming just like men, and they're not becoming like the good versions of men, they're becoming like the bad versions of men. They're becoming promiscuous, they're becoming alcoholics, they're becoming narcissistic, they're becoming uh, uh, grandiose, yeah, they're, be they're becoming hysterical, you know, like men. Men can be hysterical, right? Going off on anger. Everything is anger. It's the same thing with women. It's what feminism has become. Feminism has become a shadow of its former self. It's a joke today, right? Um, and there's so many other things, you know? There's so many other things. It's, it's, it's just absolutely terrible. So, yeah, anyway. Second, second if, uh, uh, adaptive point. Alcohol is restorative. It restores or even creates, <laughs> right? Um, because often it, there was nothing there to begin with. It restores confidence. It restores self-esteem. It restores, and this, uh, this is via the grandiosity. Where, where it gives you the grandiosity, uh, it's, it, it's suddenly, the, I'm, I'm now suddenly confident. I now suddenly have self-esteem. I now suddenly feel good about myself. And these things are wonderful things to have, but not through alcohol. They have to, if they don't come from a genuine place, they're going to be destructive, right? Um, it helps, uh, 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 and here's an interesting thing. It helps people to, to, and once upon a time, they used to say, a real man does not need to behave macho. And there was more truth to that than you would think. Because what they've discovered with alcohol is that alcohol allows a person to re to fully reoccupy their gender and their gender role more especially with those who have self-image problems so a man who feels like an imposter as a man who feels like uh, who doesn't feel confident who's get, who's who gets picked on who gets all of these things when he when it gets alcohol, he suddenly goes from, from the beta male to the alpha male, right? And this is why you get that very stereotypical uh, male behavior, that puffed up, that arrogant, that whatever, with alcohol. Because if prior to that, the man is not confident, if he doesn't really feel like a man's man, right? The, you know, then the alcohol will help him get, will help him do that right and that's how you know and that's where the proverbs and the old observations were correct that a guy who's behaving that way 
who's he's actually pretending to be secure he's pretending to be manly because in real life he doesn't really feel manly he doesn't really feel like he belongs within the group that is the man right sort of thing and um so it's it's restorative and it's the same thing with women right um and generally speaking more often than not women have the body issue so for the man it's more about the confidence and his role in society am i am i manly enough am, am i a go-getter enough am i tough enough am i masculine enough do i make decisions do i impose my will on sort of thing and if the guy feels like and i mean and that's a that's a that's a that's a caricature of what it means to be a man it might include some of those things in their right moderation but essentially that's a bit of a caricature of what it, might, it means to be a man it's not to be a man isn't only those things right but because we have a we because we have a a a, a, a caricature view and usually that's what happens this 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 false view this cartoonish view of what it means to be a man gets funneled into these into these pathological ways of thinking and then it's expressed when when the alcohol comes up so that that cartoonish way of being a man the neanderthal beating his chest that is not actually what it means to be a man that's what it means to be a narcissist that's a narcissist right so we got so used we got so accustomed to seeing male narcissists that we thought that that's what it meant to be a man <laughs> basically sort of thing when it's not right there's confidence is 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 manly to a point but beyond that it's narcissism okay and but because we uh, human beings we tend to stereotype what happens at the extreme ends of things then you know that's what becomes the picture that we paint and the the icon the archetype as it were right which is which is a problem so so those yeah especially those with body image issues man it's like uh, and, and also for example let's say you, you if we go back to the sex drive i want to have sex i want to be intimate with someone i want to whatever but i but i don't like my body i think i'm too this i'm too that and and believe me believe me it is not only fat girls that think they're fat <laughs> there is not a single woman on the planet that doesn't have an issue with her body it's just uh, and this is one of the devastating things about the modern society right is no matter in spite of all of this body positivity uh which is why you know all of this body positivity and stuff is nothing but grandiose narcissistic bullshit none of it is real because despite all of that women feel worse about themselves today than they ever felt before how do you explain this it's because it's all false it's all fake it's all posturing it's all grandiose grandiose posturing people trying to make themselves feel better right and the reason is because even though we think we're progressing as a society we're actually not morally we're degenerating morally we are traumatizing each other much more than we ever did before and as a result we are developing these 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 psychological issues that then require a narcissistic a narcissistic adaptation in order to be able to be able to survive in the world in a hostile world the world's becoming more hostile end of story i don't care what you think what you say just because we're not yet at the point where people are running around on the streets with spears and stabbing each other it, the world is more hostile just because even if crime is redu is reduced because here's the thing one of the mistakes we make in in life is by assuming that that uh, a world with less crime is necessarily a less hostile world it's not true i can be exceptionally hostile without ever committing a crime I can abuse you verbally. I can abuse you psychologically. I can mistreat you. I can make you feel feel uh, bad. I can make you feel like trash with my children. I can abuse them mentally, psychologically. I can tell them you're worthless. You're useless. You're whatever, right? So, if you if you read uh, uh, books by like people like Steven Pinker and all of these kinds of social psychologists and stuff, they'll tell you, oh, we have less crime than we've, and that's true. And actually, as the world progresses and the technology yes uh, crime decreases as the standard of living because once upon a time uh, most of the world was below the poverty line and now 50 percent of the world is now been lifted above the poverty line we're making great strides but 
just because these things are improving does not mean we are less hostile to each other at all in fact we're worse and the internet has as is is one of the ways that has made it worse uh the, because narcissism is on the increase whilst all of these other things may be on the decrease psychological disorders that do not that do not necessarily bring out a criminal behavior but bring out hurtful damaging interpersonal relationships relations those things are on the increase so I don't have to worry so much about being mugged in the streets but I dread going to work because there's that person there who's so miserable that by the end of the day I feel traumatized because this person is just out to get me all the time or is just it's so miserable so <laughs> that I can't handle I almost can't handle going to work anymore because my manager is such a narcissist is such a s miserable son of a gun is making it and that's traumatic right our our definitions because we live in such a because the modern world is so materialistic we think about everything in very shallow materialistic ways oh there's no more crime therefore we're all more happy rubbish rubbish right rubbish right Three, it's disinhibitory. We've spoken about this before. So it, it legitimizes narcissistic and borderline behaviors, right? So the, the di disinhibition, and suddenly, man, I can be all of these things. That grandiosity, when that grandiosity kicks in, and suddenly you don't feel, instead of feeling like a mouse, you feel like a lion. Maybe for the first time in your life. Prior, prior to this, so the, the first time a person ever gets drunk, Prior to that, I got picked on, I was rejected, I was an outcast, I, I was awkward around girls. That first time I get drunk, man, suddenly I can get the girl. Suddenly I'm funny. Suddenly people are, are laughing at my jokes. Suddenly, suddenly I'm the center of attention. Suddenly, oh, I'm the man or I'm the woman. That's, that's amazing right that's amazing and they'll do it again and they'll do it again and they'll do it again and that becomes a pattern of behavior and after a while and this is why i mean if you talk to most people that are alcoholics and have a problem drinkers they've been this way since they were in their teenage years because in the years of development when you're still a teenager when you're growing up where you are supposed to be developing your psychological and your emotional and your social skills instead of developing them you are putting you are repressing them and you are using a prosthesis to do it for you and so the muscles whenever of 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 being social of being coping with stress of coping with social situations and it says and the prevalence of alcohol in social situations shows you how many people have no social skill whatsoever and as soon as you think about that, you think, oh my goodness, it is rampant. Because as someone who, who grew up, never, I've never been a drinker, ever in my life. I don't know why. Just, I can't stand. <laughs> Maybe that's a good thing. I cannot stand the taste of alcohol. I just, it's like, it's the most, it's whiskey. Brand, it's like, I've, I've tried, I've tried tasting this and I taste, and I'm like, <laughs> this stuff is swill. <laughs> I can't, I don't understand it. But let me tell you, man, growing up, people would always look at me like I was a weirdo because I didn't drink, almost like I was a bit of an outcast. Fortunately, <laughs> or, or unfortunately, I was enough of a narcissist, right? Uh, so for those of you that are watching, uh, that are for this for the first time that don't know me from my channel, uh, I have in the past have uh, I've discovered and I've tried to ameliorate I've had very very pronounced psychopath uh, sociopathic uh, which uh, type 2 psychopathy sociopathic and narcissistic traits uh, so gra of a grandiose grandiose narcissistic traits um, and uh, even though I wouldn't actually get a diagnosis but I have the traits because everything is on a spectrum right so you can have trait or a style or you can have the full-on disorder so I've always had traits and styles 
sort of thing of narcissistic of narcissism as well as sociopathic traits and stuff like that so i could achieve i could achieve what so what alcohol allows some people to achieve i was able to achieve on my own naturally without alcohol therefore i was able to do all of the social things and be that person right i i, I was that guy right sort of thing and then i had to realize i'm being a narcissist i'm being a sociopath i need to stop doing this um maybe that's a a video i need to do another time my my conversion as it were sort of thing right um so it's it's uh so yeah it's in disinhibitory man anyone that we we're living in a world where 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 anxiety fear and anxiety and shame are are like ruling principles they govern so many people and i mean just imagine something you're afraid of but terrifyingly afraid of some of you might not be able to imagine this um if you are <laughs> psychopathic or grandiose enough <laughs> you know or, or even legitimately not afraid of anything doesn't necessarily mean you know but i've always struggled the fear of something you know I, so for me it was always struggle uh which is why i saw i uh, before until i learned these things i used to be prejudiced against people who did experience uh fear and anxiety something which i'm i'm very regretful of right um but imagine if you can something you're absolutely terrified of and then one day you drink you drink this magic potion and suddenly you're not afraid anymore suddenly you're not afraid anymore bloody hell you the world is your oyster <laughs> you know uh it's 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 serious it's serious that disinhibition is psychologically it's highly highly adaptive man and it's addictive that's what's addictive right the world is now my oyster i'm now lo no longer afraid right um so yeah and the fourth point it is highly highly instrumental right alcohol is instrumental it's an instrument like i was saying it's like a prosthesis right it allows one to accomplish goals that they would have never tried when sober right uh it requires the confidence that i don't have requires a certain audacity that i never had requires a, a a certain grandiosity a certain courage that i never had before right um you know i suddenly uh and it can actually make you a little bit psychopathic because you know uh i suddenly i ended up with i ended up with that girl that i never would have been able to get if i was sober I I uh, I ended up with that person's money. <laughs> I did that. Uh, I didn't have to be drunk though. Um, you know, it's actually very telling. There were one, or there were a few times in my life where people were like, "Dude, were you drunk?" And I was like, "No, I did that person perfectly sober." That shows you how psychopathic I was. I used to be. It's just yeah, no, I was completely sober when I did that. It's like, oh my goodness, man, the kind of person I used to be anyway it's another story for another time you know they so suddenly you feel good you 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 uh, you know you feel you go from doormat to king suddenly that guy that's been picking on you that you 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 were too afraid to face him up suddenly you have the courage to to get in his face and tell him what for right suddenly you you suddenly you are self-efficacious right self-efficacy i can do things i can be someone i am someone who wouldn't want to feel that way no wonder <laughs> no wonder people get addicted to substances no wonder people get addicted to alcohol and no wonder people stay addicted to alcohol in fact the question shouldn't be why do people relapse the question should be how the hell did people ever manage to give it up that's the mystery right that is the mystery how do people even give it up in the first place why isn't everyone an alcoholic right well it's because we've all got different coping mechanisms this is the thing right some people have alcoholism others others of us have other stuff that we use as coping mechanisms right as adaptive maladaptive responses to a hostile to a hostile world hostile peer group hostile parents hop, just you know 
maybe you'll you know maybe your life has really been an absolute bloody hell and for some people it really is life is an absolute bloody hell and you know it's uh, what you, what can you do if you know it's like they say if if i didn't laugh i would cry and this is the thing if if i if i didn't drink i'd kill myself why um and sometimes that's what happens sometimes that's what happens um so yeah suddenly you know you can you can you know you can do uh, if you feel like you're a hostage you feel like you're a hostage like you are being oppressed by a, a circumstance or a situation or a person right you feel you feel this like us like that you know like you you've got a, a weight on your shoulders right it's hanging above your head and suddenly that's lifted why wouldn't you want that right <laughs> <laughs> duh why wouldn't you want that right um it's like and here's here's a, uh, what's very ironic is we we actually see this kind of thing uh in in our in our uh in on television so for example in our comics for example how many of you know of the comic book uh asterix and, and obelix right with the gauls that were under being uh, oppressed by the by the romans right this little insignificant little village of fishermen and of peasants basically of gaulish peasants were holding out against the roman army and they had a magic potion and when they drank this magic magic potion man suddenly they were invincible right that's literally what alcohol does alcohol is the exact equivalent of get fixes magic potion did you ever watch the gummy bears the gummy bears have also their magic potion have you noticed on all of the kids movies there's this magic potion right there's this magic potion when i drink this potion i become i become invincible it's what al it's alcohol it's the children's version it's the children's story version of alcohol that's literally what alcohol does i'm now i'm suddenly invincible and the interesting thing is that the magic potion uh, in the gummy bears, right? For for those of you that are too are too young to re remember what the gummy, go look at the gummy bears, right? They had these little bears, and they had a magic potion that produced from some it's gummy berry juice. They called it, right? Uh, and 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 when the when the little bears took it, they could bounce around and and stuff like that. But if a human took it, they became very very strong right which is uh so the villain the villain in the movie was constantly trying to gain access it's just do you see how psychologically twisted these these little stories are the villain the, the whole thing of the villain was trying to to capture the gummy bears so that he could get the gummy berry juice so that he could drink the gummy berry juice in order to conquer the world <laughs> i mean hello right um so yeah these little these kids movies and, and and stuff like that are a lot more you know there's more to them than we think um so yeah you know suddenly you're self-efficacious and anything that you put your mind to you can do um uh you're no longer a defeated individual you are now a warrior who actually stands a chance um you are now desirable you're now good you're now good looking um and so and so both both psychological and physical things come together and form a pattern of habit that is so difficult to eventually untangle you know and one of the big important things is well something that people don't realize when we look at an alcoholic and when we give or look at a like a drug addict we think you know this person's very disorganized very chaotic and stuff like that and whilst it is true in generally speaking in, in many ways they are not because their day suddenly becomes very very highly regimented around the consumption of the substance suddenly so everything else might be in disarray but as far as their lives are concerned that revolves around this particular substance is very highly ritualized very 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 highly ritualized and and this this actually gives you a kind of meaning it's almost like a private religion becomes like a religion in a sense very highly organized very highly ritualized thing that you do
It's a ritual. It becomes like a ritual. It gives it gives a, a structure. It, it gives a kind of structure to your life, where it, before you didn't have. It also provides you with a, with a peer group because you go and you drink with people. Uh, so whereas before maybe you, you didn't make friends, you couldn't have friends. Suddenly you can make friends. And one of the things. I mean, we're dealing with uh, with with homeless people through through the charitable sort of organisations that I try to help out with. You can see that one of the most difficult things when they start becoming sober and trying to change their life, one of the first things we tell them: stop seeing the old people that you used to hang out with. And that's one of the most difficult things possibly because then, like, who am I going to hang around with? Then. How am I going to, because you can't be social, because one of the things, one of the reasons they did that in the first place is because they're trying to escape loneliness. Which is why part of the rehabilitation, if you do not trade the unhealthy social circle for a healthy social circle, the person is not going to recover. The person needs to be around people who are who are good, honest people, who are teetotal. There's no who do not drink. Find yourself, find yourself fundament, some fun, fundamentalist Christian friends, <laughs> right? Uh, that you know, it's it's people, you know. But good, good fun because not just because they're Christian doesn't mean they're any good, right? Because they can be judgmental. Oh, you're an alcoholic. Eh, you, you know. But find the really, really good people who have lead clean lives and stuff like that, you know. Um, and and that's how and that's how you move on to on, on from this, right? So to move on from this, to 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 try and kick the habit, what do you do? What the hell do you do? First of all, get assessed. Get yourself assessed. Um, one, do a personality test to find out your person. What what's your personality, right? When you do and try to do it in a highly highly controlled environment. So, <coughs> pardon me. Um, highly highly controlled environment. So, you you are comfortable. You've slept well. You're not on alcohol, and you haven't recently come off it, right? Go for about go for a few weeks without the alcohol. Um, so that you can come as back to yourself, your normal self as possible. Um, uh, don't be hungry. Don't do it when you're hungry. Don't do it when you're stuffed, right? Don't do it when you're tired. So try to, so that you can be in as normal self state as possible so that you don't influence uh, the, the outcome of the test, okay? Do a personality test and find out where you are in your big five personality tests so that you can see what you're working with. Right? Know what you're working with. Do I have low conscientiousness or do I have high conscientiousness? Low, agree low agreeableness, high agreeableness. And you, in that way, you can assess what are my strengths, what are my weaknesses, where can I cope, where can I emphasize my life towards my strengths so that I can uh, increase my chances of being successful, and where are my weaknesses so that I know that I can avoid those things. Right? Or bring high quality people into my life that can help balance out my weaknesses. Right? So do a personality test. Find out what am I working with here? Okay? And do it with people who really know you. Right? Try find the best people that you can and maybe get them to do the test for you because when they look at the answer, you might think, yeah, I think I'm like this. And they might be, you know what? Hang on. You maybe are not. Maybe you're a little bit more this way and that way rather than over there. It can help you if you're not uh, if you're not so sure. You're right, you know. But someone you trust, someone you really trust, you know, who's who's known you a while and can make these make these kinds of assessments, and then get assessed for get assessed for uh, to see do I have any other disorders? Do I have depression? Do I have uh, do I have a personality disorder? Right. Do I have ADD? Do I have autism? Do I have one of these? You know, is there something else that is underlying this? Do I have a trauma somewhere in my life that is unresolved? Uh, do I have a problem with something that is unresolved? You've got to face these things. It's going to be bloody hard work. Let me tell you right now. <laughs> it's just, you know. But if you want to maximize getting away from this stuff, you've got to build. So remember what I said. The alcohol is a prosthesis. 
like a crutch is for a broken leg. If you fix that leg, you won't need to go back to the crutches. Okay? Now that temptation will always be there. Because it's, it's difficult, right? Even once you've developed those skills, it gets easier over time, okay? It does get easier over time. But every now and then you're going to be thinking, you're going to get those now, you're going to think, damn it, it's easier just to, just to have a shot of magic potion, right? It really is. But, you know, but make sure you've got the right people. They'll be like, nah, man, come, come. Let's, let's do this. Come, we can do it. Let's, let's, let's go. It's people who can cheer you on and, you know, can be there for you. Right? And that's how you, that's how you, you have to know who you are. What are you working with? What, what's the damage? Right? We don't want to know. We don't want to know that we're damaged. Right? It's why we, <laughs> it's why we have the alcohol in the first place. It's because we're damaged and we're trying to, remember, we're trying to dissociate. Right? You've got to stop. You've got to learn self-love. This is your first thing. Learn self-love. And you cannot love yourself until you know who you are because then who, who are you going to love if you don't know who you are? You can't love something you don't know. Right? Because if you love something you don't know that is not real, then you're not loving yourself. You're loving a fantasy. You're loving a, a, a cartoon character that doesn't exist. You've got to, and I've got a video coming up, coming up shortly, uh, maybe within the next week, hopefully, about self love. What is self love? Really, really. Okay? And I guarantee you, every single one of us are doing these things that we do because we do not love ourselves. And probably because, and the reason we do not love ourselves is because we've never been loved properly in our lives. Truly. And it sounds weird. It sounds cliche. It sounds namby pamby. You know, love fixes all. <laughs> Believe me, I get it. I get it. I've been there. Right. And the reason why we have that attitude towards hearing that, oh, self-love, and we think, ah, it's namby-pamby nonsense, is because most of the stuff out there is namby-pamby nonsense. It's namby-pamby namby crap. Right? Most of the self-love nonsense out there is crap, is not true. It's actually, it's actually narcissism masquerading as self-love. Okay? That's what it actually is. When you feel that instinct that there's ah, something wrong here, it's because usually there's something wrong, right? All of these gurus, all of these life coaches, all of these self-help people, most of the stuff that they're peddling is not self-love. It's narcissism. They are peddling, nar which is why it's so successful. Because if they were, because true self-love means that you love yourself warts and all. Right? Means you love yourself as a whole person. Good parts and bad parts. And the whole reason we're in this problem in the first place is because we're trying to get away from the bad parts of ourselves. And in many senses because we think that we are nothing but bad. Right? We've been convinced of it at some point in our lives. I am only bad. I am a bad object only bad and i'm trying to i'm my whole life i'm spin i'm i'm running away from myself that's what we're doing we're running away from it's like what the hell are you running around? i'm running away from myself is what i'm doing technically speaking right and self-love means turning around and a realizing the truth about yourself that a you are not 100 percent bad object you have good parts and you have bad parts you are a much more nuanced individual than you believe than you and what other people would have you believe right you are much more nuanced there's more var variation in you than people think than even you think so once you've realized that and you now really know who you are then you have something to love but these self-help gurus and stuff like that as they're peddling narcissism because they never tell you they never you the most successful people on the internet are those ones who will never tell you that there's something wrong with you they will tell you oh they will basically tell you the online gurus and narcissists they are basically taking the role uh of of the alcohol so whereas the alcohol gives you that sense of grandiosity and 
I'm all good and I'm all great. The online gurus and stuff like that are playing the same role. They will only tell you, you're so wonderful. You are great. You are empathic. You are God's gift. You can do anything you put your mind to. This is counterfactual. None of us. I mean, I've got leukemia. There's certain things I will never do, no matter how much I put my life, my mind to it, right? I've got ADD. Certain things I will never be able to do. End of story. There are certain things I can do. There's certain things I can't do. But one thing I cannot do is anything I put my mind to. That's rubbish. It's not, it's not true. And the fact that it's not true is not a bad thing. It's like, so what if I can't do everything I put my mind to? As long as I can do the things that I'm good at, well, hey, <laughs> well, what more do you need? Right? What more do you need? Um, you need to know yourself truly, who you are, and that's going to cause problems. You're not going to want to see that. You, those bad parts, you're not going to want to see it. But you need to see it. Integrate your shadow integrate the dark parts of yourself yes i am actually i'm good over here there are these positive aspects right and some of those things that i and some of the things that i thought i had i don't actually have some of the good qualities i thought i have i don't actually have you know like people who go on american idol and stuff like that who think they can sing <laughs> but it's like no <laughs> right they need to for their if they continue to insist that they can sing they're going to live a miserable life aren't they because they're going to pursue a career and they're never going to make it why because they can't actually sing but you know what they might be really good at something else but for as long as they keep themselves under delusion ignoring what they're good at and pretending that they're good at something they're not their lives are going to be miserable they're setting themselves up for failure and this is what you need to do in your in your in your life the only way you can love yourself is if you realize who you are good and bad and the bad parts once you know what the bad parts are you can work on improving them you can go like if you if you if you struggle with confidence and stuff like that you can go for assertiveness training you can go for there are, there are ways around these things there are ways around these things right even friends who can help build you up and be like no dude you can do it well you know i'll come with you Right? You're feeling a bit insecure. You're feeling, you know what? Fair enough. I'll come with you. Right? You're afraid of that job interview. You know what? I'll drive you to the job interview. I'll take, I'll go, I'll sit in the car, but I'll come with you. Right? And then afterwards, once you're done, I will go for a beer. No, we're not going to go for a beer. We're going to go for, <laughs> we're going to go for some apple juice. Right? Not cider, apple juice. We're going to go for an orange juice. Right? You see how easy? Beer. Just go for a beer. It's just, it's just, it's, it's what's done, right? Not beer. Go for a, go for a, go for a steak and, steak and sausage and chips dinner, right? Have a self a Coca-Cola or whatever. Chill out, you know, afterwards. The high stress, you know, you can do it. No problem. Here's your CV. And you might, and you might need someone in the beginning. You might feel like a bit of a child, like you're asking a lot. You know, I mean, I've had... I've had people that I work with. I sit with them and I help them make their CVs. I help them uh, sort of go through to look for jobs, you know, and stuff like that. And you've got to you got, get someone who's, find someone who's willing to spend that time, you know. And there are people out there. There are people out there who can do it, you know. But the problem is that sometimes we don't go and find those people because we're too ashamed to do it. And there's the problem, isn't it? It's like there are, those good Samaritans do exist out there, right? The problem is a lot of the time we're too ashamed to go and, you know, and so, and sometimes even when they approach us, because we're ashamed, we might, oh, you know, I don't need you because we're ashamed that, you, but listen, we all, we all need help at some point. Every single bloody one of us, every last one of us, without exception, right? The only person who needs no one is a narcissist. And even they need someone more than anyone else. The only difference is they don't realize it. Right? Only psychopaths and narcissists believe that they don't need anyone. But it's not true. It's not true of anyone. Anyway, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I hope this helps you. I really do. Um, and uh, good day. Good mental health. And God bless you. Cheerio.